Boom, 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 literature gets a look. Let's talk about books. Hello and welcome to Legs Talk About Books, the monthly podcast where we talk about books. I'm your host, of course, Hard Leg Joe. Joining me today, brand new co-host, uh, Mr. MBT. Hey everybody, nice to be here. I figured the show could use at least one more Joe, so Just, I'm here to oblige. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about, you know, now that it's us, maybe we should change the name of the podcast to Two Joes Talk About Books. Just two Joes. It's just two Joes. Just two Joes hanging out, being Joe bros. And We're yeah, average if you're, if Joes. If you're familiar with the show, if you're wondering what happened to my other co-hosts, just really briefly, well, I normally record in my basement. It is full of wasps, so I had to move somewhere else. I'm in my bedroom, actually, right now. And there's not enough room for people to join me in person, so I had to record it online. And uh, my other two co-hosts, CB and Bootleg, neither of them have good computers or good microphones or recording setups. So Mr. Mr. Joseph is, is joining me this month. And, uh, you know, if things work out, maybe he'll join me for future ones. If not, maybe he'll just be a special guest. Either way, it's good to have you here. No pressure. It's good to be here. And um, don't worry, I never feel pressure when... Uh, being allowed to broadcast my own opinions to hundreds of people. <laughs> to to about, yeah, about a hundred. A little over a hundred. We're still not that big, unfortunately. That's okay. I'm used to zero people listening to what I have to say, so this is a nice change of pace. Yeah. I still gotta, at some point, I've, I've gotta put this on, like, iTunes or wherever podcasts go. I don't know, I don't really listen to podcasts anywhere but YouTube. Uh, but either way, you know, if, you, if you're listening, if, if there's anywhere you'd like us to put this podcast, any recommendations you have, leave it down in the comments. And without that, let's, let's just go ahead and jump right into it. So yes, if you're not part of the Hard Leg Book Club, which you should totally join, I've been telling people about what we're going to read beforehand, so you can hopefully join in, ask questions, you know, just become part of the podcast. And this month, we decided for a spooky Halloween episode to do seven stories of H.P. Lovecraft, renowned for his spookiness. We've got The Call of Cthulhu, Color Out of Space, Cool Air, Dunwich Horror, The Music of Eric Zahn, Shadow Over Innsmouth, and The White Ship. And so, you know, if you haven't read those yet, you know, it's he's public domain. There's, like, audiobooks on YouTube of people just reading him out. Like, go check him out. We're not really going to be doing, like, a synopsis or anything, talking about everything in there. We're mostly going to be talking about the themes and stuff. Pretty much just assuming you've already read the story. And I guess we're, yeah, we're just going to go, uh, alphabetical here, which, uh, Call of Cthulhu. Let's start with that one. Uh, I should reveal right now that, um, prior to this experience, I had almost no interaction with the mythos outside of, like, uh, popular culture. You know, I had, I knew the references, but I'd never really delved into the actual meat of the product. So I came into Call of Cthulhu with all these misgivings about how it was going to be such a foundational work for uh, what has become, you know, kind of an international phenomenon um, that spans, like, books, movies, games, etc. And I was really unimpressed with this story. Yeah. It was it was super destabilizing. Yeah, I, I've read it twice now because I, I got really into Lovecraft last year again. Like you, I've heard so many things. I mean, Cthulhu was in South Park. You, you, it's been <laughs> everywhere. Uh, everyone kind of knows who Cthulhu is, but not that many people have actually read the texts and everything. So I went into it like, all right, let's get it. Call of Cthulhu, and it just kind of underwhelming, to be honest. Yeah. Um. I mean. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but I think so much of Lovecraft's uh, strength lies in writing about extremely frightening unknowns. And so much in this story is very literally described, you know? Yeah. Um, I think there's a quote from him that actually says, like, the strongest emotion is fear, and the biggest fear is the fear of the unknown. And yet in this one, he's, like, very analytical in describing the unknown. <laughs> there's an entire section of the work that is... Uh, dedicated to describing the intricacies of a figurette of the big bad. <laughs> it's like, yeah, there he is. This Nothing is exactly to be scared of. what he looks like. He's a giant squid dragon, essentially. <laughs> the other thing that frightened me about this one is that so little of the mythos is actually discussed. Um, you know, there are vague hintings at the monsters that have kind of become mainstays within the genre. Um, but for what it's worth... 
really only Cthulhu figures into the story at all. Uh, I spoke with you about this, and I thought it was very ironic that an individual renowned for his ability to conjure up uh, indescribable horrors in bequeathing the mythos to other writers, um, intentionally or unintentionally, had a ton of worse people describing said horrors for yeah. decades. There, there's not really a whole lot of mythos information here, but there, there are a lot of themes that sort of start here. His whole thing about, like, non-Euclidean geometry being, like, beyond comprehension, that actually shows up in a lot of his stories. Um, sort of the idea of, like, the dreams and the mythicism and the, the, the existential dread is there. There's some, there's some yeah. themes that are there. There is, I think, the most frightening thing in this story is the pervasive sense of inevitability that you get, uh throughout the discussion, as in this is a cycle that has repeated, will repeat in the future despite our best efforts, and while we can do what we can to stave it off, you know, eventually we will have to reckon with Cthulhu. Uh, the other thing that I found particularly frightening was, despite all of the description they spent on Cthulhu, he is described as a priest. Like, this is yeah. the best frontage that uh, deep elder old gods can give. This is the kindest individual among all of them, and, you know, it's this really, really spooky well, person what's interesting to me is they, they elaborate that on a little bit what makes it spooky that he's a priest is that like cthulhu to us is like a god he's just like he's immortal he doesn't die he just sort of sleeps his nightmares go on to other people and he worships a god who is even more powerful than him <laughs> i will say <laughs> i will say um on the topic of worship this is i think the most racist one we read <laughs> Yeah, probably. It, it's really weird. The first time I read it, I didn't really pick up on anything. But yeah, there is a lot of sort of like describing all the mud people that worship Cthulhu <laughs> and all the, yeah. for lack of a better term. Although, again, I think part of the reason, and we'll get into this later too, is like, of course. to him, like, Spaniards and people from the South Pacific and... I wouldn't be surprised if the French were included in there. Like, literally anyone who's not like a Norwegian or like a upper bred English person is, is kind of included in that. I do love that so much of this story is spent um, deriding the ancient cultures of these, like, noble savages, you know? Like, he describes the voodoo orgies and the bothersome tribes of uh, uh, South America. And then as soon as they're proven right, he's like, these individuals, degraded and ignorant as they were, were actually completely correct. Yeah. You know, this this yeah, whole thing I, is right. I, I think that's kind of the scary part, this idea... Especially, I don't think he was religious, but I think writing for the, at the times, like in the 1920s, you had a pretty religious America. And so the idea that like, oh yeah, these tribes that are worshipping these pagan gods, they're the correct ones and you're wrong. Like that would have been really scary to people back then. And we'll speak about this uh, in his other works, but there is a lot of criticism of kind of Abrahamic religion, um, like monotheistic religion, um, and the fact that religion doesn't really get you anything unless it's to concrete, visible, uh, potentially nightmare gods. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the, the fundamental, let's go, we're going in, again, alphabetical, I think we said. Um, well, mm -hmm. Was there anything else you wanted to say about Cthulhu specifically, or are you ready to just go on to the next one? There is one particular quote that I very much like. It's when they are the, they are describing the ritual. This is a second-hand description, so, you know, yeah. take it with a grain of salt, but it goes, There are vocal qualities peculiar to men, and vocal qualities peculiar to beasts, and it is terrible to hear the one when the source should yield the other. Yeah, And that was one got... of the, like, very few turns of phrase that I went, oh, that's actually horrifying. Yeah, yeah. that's really creepy. He's, he's, he's got a way with words. I remember listening to the, again, I, I trying to get people to do this. I went to the, the audio book versions of these. And I, I remember seeing someone talking in the comments being like, man, listening to this, I'm reminded of how great English can actually be. Like when oh, he yeah. wants to write, he can make some really, really good statements and stuff. It's just a pity a lot of his exposition's really clunky, but yeah. Uh, so, Color Out of Space, that's the next one, and that's my, my favorite Lovecraft story. It, it slightly beats out At the Mountains of Madness, which we haven't read, and I think you said that was your favorite of the ones you read as well. It was. I did spoil myself. I read this one first because um, I sorted alphabetically incorrectly, and Color Out of Space came before Call of Cthulhu. And um, it set this unreal precedent that none of the other work we looked at uh, came close to. Um, it is a fantastic story. Um, far and away, my favorite. 
I, I'm really looking... Did, did you uh, hear that they've made a movie adaptation of it this year? Oh my goodness. That, that is... That's actually very exciting. It's, I'm going to look that up right now. It stars Nicolas Cage as the farmer. And there goes the excitement. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No. Oh, <laughs> it's got a 6.5 on IMDb. Yeah, oh, it's no. got kind of mixed... Uh, from what I heard, because it premiered at festivals first... They're like, yeah, the beginning's kind of boring. It has a really cool climax, but it's not really worth it to get to that. See, the unfortunate part is that in this one specifically, Lovecraft's writing on the indescribable is at its all-time peak in any of the work that we wrote. Yeah. And to pick this as the visual adaptation, I mean... <laughs> it's it's one of those things... It's really hard to make a visual adaptation because the whole idea is that, like, you're being haunted by, like, a color... Like a radiation, yeah. almost, that does not exist in the regular spectrum. You're seeing weird shit you can't describe. Doing this as spoiler-free as possible, there is a moment when a creature that is indescribable um, is seen, and so little is told to you about the composition of this creature. And I'm just imagining Nicolas Cage, like, looking dumbfounded <laughs> at, like, a very clear representation of something and going, Whoa. Just very oh, no. wide eye. Whoa. That's I mean, crazy. That's, that's, he can really freak out when he wants to. Oh, yeah. like when he goes over the top. But no, I think, what, what was it? There, there has been a short short film made of this that I've he I haven't seen it, but I've heard it's really effective. And what it does is it films the entire thing in black and white, except for the color, which is like a bright, vibrant purple. See, that's a better approach. At the very least, while it's visible to us, uh, it is clearly out of place in the world of um. Yeah, it, it lets you know how unsettling it is compared to everything else. There's just uh, so much to talk about uh, in yeah. terms of the color out of space. I wrote Dracula-ing a bunch of times in my notes. Uh, because I, I had, Yeah, I had no other way to describe the process uh, that the quote-unquote color goes through. But um, it, it felt like, to me, a scathing critique of um, human knowledge. And you have all these... Uh, rural characters, uh, you know, the farmer, Ami, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, uh, Nahurm? That's yeah, I, right. don't, I don't know how to pronounce it. it it's close, but um, uh, this idea that this, like, pre-modern ruralism is um, more adept at uh, dealing with this type of extra-dimensional threat than, like, a... Scientist. Uh, yeah, an academic interpretation that absolutely must be able to quantify and... Um, dissect something before they're able to uh, do anything actionable and i i just i love this one it's so good yeah. um the the narrator's uh individual perspective changes over the course of the work uh, at the very beginning he's like listing chemicals uh to this rural farmer and the farmer's like yeah yeah they put it in sulfur mono colosti i sure whatever i don't need, like just nodding along and by the end you know he has also uh, as everyone involved just abandoned scientific principles of reasoning and method um, just to observe, because that's really all you can do. Yeah, you just gotta kind of react to things you can't over- -an See, it's, it's, I didn't really see it as sort of, like, anti-scientific. I saw it as more of that, that thing of, like, well, let's wait and see, let's analyze, when, like, maybe the you should just be practical, like, maybe you should just run <laughs> and right. ask the questions later. And I feel that, like, in a lot of ways, it talks about how, you know, the mechanisms of change that alienate people that are effective or that are affected, end up kind of bleeding into the background, you know? Like, if something horrible is happening for an extended period of time, uh, especially for individuals in, you know, really sequestered communities, you just kind of learn to deal with it, uh, to the point where, you know, um, this uh, farmstead is being sucked dry, and everyone's just like, ah, you know, that's just the way it is. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, I, I just, really... oh, it's so good. It really does kind of almost, like, bring parallels to, like, you know, for a very dark term, like, in a rural town, a father who's, like, beating the crap out of his wife and kids, and it's sort of like, oh, everyone knows something bad's happening, but they just sort of, well, that's their, that's their thing. They gotta deal with that, you know. Yeah, let them, let and them similarly, move. they don't talk about uh, the, uh, I guess, sucking of color uh, at all in, in this... Uh, in this one, until it becomes absolutely unignorable. Yeah, and even then, now they're like, oh, that's the blasted heap, don't go there. 
<laughs> and I love that. I love that the end result is um, effectively a bureaucrat is going to endanger all of humanity again. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, put a put a reservoir over it. Uh, how did it transfer? Oh, he drank the water. Eh, you know what? Who cares? Put it's, the reservoir over it. Yeah, it's it's fine. But I mean, honestly, like that that that's the kind of the terrifying thing about it. like what's he gonna do? Be like, oh yeah, some old farmer said an alien radiation landed here. Don't build a reservoir here. Yeah, like, no, yeah, it, it yeah, really. Sure, buddy. It does a good job of, of letting you know that often uh, the mechanisms that prevent, you know, uh, horrifying atrocity from taking place are just a general disbelief on the part of individuals who aren't affected. Like, oh yeah, totally. <laughs> anyway, just keep doing it. it. It it really is weird talking to you. I didn't realize, like, yeah, it works. It It's horrible in so many, di not horrible, but it's horrifying in so many different ways. Sort of like the in-caring bureaucracy, the unknown of this outer space organism, the way people deal with it, like, everything sort of comes together on this one. And like uh, Call of Cthulhu, some of the stuff that's the most effective for me are discussions of inevitability and discussions of ambiguity. You have the uh, narrator kind of questioning whether this thing has manifested in the uh, person telling him the story to some degree, horrified at the possibility that there exist other specimens or that the drop back down uh, from the being was intentional. And those questions are never resolved. And it's it's fantastic. It's chilling. And it's the site, like, the, the, the blasted heat seems to be slowly spreading. Maybe in a year. Yeah, it's, it keeps year. growing. It's hard to say. It's, <laughs> it's, it's such a wide area and it's growing so slowly. But if it is growing, it's like the thing. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, exactly. I think one of my, my favorite parts about this, though, just one last thing, because it, this is, to me, the, the best part of, like, Lovecraft's writing, is this sort of, like, when he describes something by sort of, like, describing something else, like, something commonplace. Like, to me, yes. the most horrific imagery in this is, like, the people looking outside and they see the, the leaveless trees, like, blowing in the wind, and then just this realization that there's no wind, that the trees are just sort of, like... Yes. Moving. It's, I don't know, just something about that imagery really creeps me out. When it's and like, it's this fantastic. seems normal, but it's not. Yeah, it's fantastic that it is a scene that would be normal except for the conditions surrounding it. Yeah. And I think that's just, oh, uh, that's just such and a, um, especially a poignant like, you know, point. E even if it, just going back to the uh, adaptation, that's one of those things that's really hard to do in like a movie too, because it's hard to show like... Oh, there's no wind, but there you kind of have to feel it. <laughs> uh, pans over from Nick Cage's face to, like, a barometer and a weather yeah. vane, and it's like, oh, there's no meteorological explanation for this phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> Just a very side tangent. Um, I, I assume, are you familiar with the movie The Happening? <laughs> oh, yes, I am. Yeah. That's uh, M. Night Shyamalan's movie about the, the trees that release the chemicals that cause people to kill themselves. Mm-hmm. That he, he, apparently, when it came out, he touted it being very Lovecraftian. And which I guess in principle it kind you know. of is. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's weird. It does but, feel like reading Lovecraft. It probably doesn't translate well to uh, film. And it really probably doesn't translate well to film with a director as completely, you know, <laughs> wild as <laughs> Shama. Well, that was a yeah. little less uh, kind than I would have been. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, the, the reason I bring up The Happening is uh, I remember some reviewer, I think it was Spoonie, bless his soul, back in the day, <laughs> and he was talking about how, like, he's like, the thing about this movie that doesn't work is that they're trying to make you scared of the wind. Because the wind <laughs> brings the chemicals, so people are sitting there, and then, like, a little breeze comes in, and people start freaking out, and it doesn't work in a movie. Yeah, he's like, it's something I'm that to... works here, but really hard to represent visually. And he's like, I'm trying to think of a way you could make it work even less and be like, what if there was a monster that only attacked when the barometric pressure was really low? And then you have people just like, eyes focused on a barometer, watching the numbers tick down, just get slowly more and more frightened. That's interesting, because a like, lot of the things that are, like, measurable for us are very frightening. Like, the difference between, like, night and day. It'd be very easy to have a scene where, like, you zoom in on a clock as it slowly, like, night falls, and then, you know, creatures come out. But the wind, it's just not translatable. <laughs> it just it just doesn't work very well. It works in this. Um, but yeah, tangent aside, the third story here. Cool air. What did you think about that one? Have to disavow this one because it implies that New York is not the greatest, classiest city on the face of the earth. <laughs> Folks, um, 
Cool Air was interesting. Uh, I spoke with you about this earlier, but for me, it feels a lot like a campfire story. Like, you would sit down, tell it, and then at the very end, uh, someone jumps out with a mask and goes, ah. And it turns out he was dead all along. Ooh. Yeah, like, you know. Spoilers. I, oh, I don't care. It's cool. This one... it's, you read this because it's funny. Yeah. I will say the Porsche, the portions of this one that I found particularly insightful um, were that it almost seemed like a critique of, like, phrenology, which, of course, is completely now discredited and doesn't need to be said. But the main character spends, like, 45 minutes of this, like, hour-long story trying to diagnose the birth of this, uh, of the individual that he's working with. Um, <laughs> he's like, ah, oh, he's got, like, some eastern cheekbones, and, like, he's got some, like, <laughs> Italian, uh, nasal passages, and completely misses that the dude is dead. <laughs> like, yeah. it's like, all, all this time trying to, like, oh, well, he's got the earlobes of an aboriginal. Oh, it, <laughs> except he's, like, vampiric. He's, like, sallowed. It always comes back to skull shape every oh, time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or something. Um, and I, I do think that it is uh, uh, telling that the individuals who are less into this type of stuff that see the doctor later in the story are frightened, not like because of the appearance of his outward figure, but kind of like an intuition about the appearance of his soul. You know, they yeah. can tell that there's a profound evil or darkness all alongside this person that for some reason, everyone, the uh, the protagonist is like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, I mean, he saved me from a heart attack. He's fine. You do what you gotta no, the, do. The, the thing I like about this is that there, there's a... Even though I, I'm very much sort of like... I don't like to look at the author a lot of times when I'm right, analyzing right, right. work. I'm very much the author is dead. Like, judge it on its own merits. But you can look at a lot of Lovecraft stuff and sort of be like, these are the things he was afraid of. And this is how he sort of, like, dealt with them. Like, he didn't like sea creatures, he didn't like the ocean, he thought the vast depths were frightening, and that's why you get stuff like Call of Cthulhu. Which they um, are. He, he was, like, you know, in, in his time, he was learning about radiation, and learning about, like, the electromagnetic spectrum. A lot of that stuff was kind of new in his time, and he found it frightening. That sort of formed the basis for the color out of space. This idea that invisible rays could kill you. And so when you take that to cool air... Um, air conditioning was new, and <laughs> oh, this you is think basically that it's a... him just being like, I don't trust this unnatural air conditioning blowing cool air about. It's not right. Oh, I love that. I, you know, shouts out to Foucault, uh, author function, very important, you know, death of the author, completely valid, understandable metric by which to uh, examine things. Uh, but you do miss out on stuff like this yeah. by not participating in a little bit of, like, historicism. And yeah. that is the funniest interpretation of this one by far. It was just him, like, super scared at an air conditioning, like, I gotta write a story about this shit. People need you, to know. You can imagine um, him sitting in, like, a 200-degree terrible apartment. He describes an apartment in here as a bearable place to hibernate till one might really live again. And yeah. above, there's the incessant rattling of his neighbor's air conditioner, and he goes... Oh, you'll see. I'm going to make you look like a fool. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the, the other the other interesting thing about this is that uh, I think you talk about like uh, sort of his anti-scientific or like very cautious scientific outlook. And I think it's the worst in cool air. Yeah. Because this this guy literally learns to keep himself alive after death. And then Lovecraft is like, oh, I burnt all his notes. That, <laughs> that's devil shit. <laughs> and for what it's that. worth, he's probably right. Uh, I mean, kind of, but at the same time, it's like, think of how far science could have come if they had that guy's notes. Yeah, but a, a concept that, like, there is some knowledge that even if it's easy to obtain is, like, unholy or, um, inev like, corrupts your soul absolutely. I mean, it's returned to again and again in these stories, and you are right in that it is most clear in this one. Yeah, I mean, to, to be fair, that's kind of like science fiction in general has always sort of had this tinge of like, don't play God, don't go too far, what if we mess with the wrong forces? But like, the thing about this is that nothing really bad happened because the guy left himself alive, except for that he melted eventually. <laughs> <laughs> like, he wasn't, like, he had, oh, I got a creepy feeling about him, he feels like he's inherently evil. Like, but was he? He saved you from a heart attack. 
Seemed well, like that, a nice guy. <laughs> sure, you had to wear a coat when you went into his room, but, like, how big of a deal is that, really? Yeah. I mean, honestly, if we could keep, like, I don't know, Abraham Lincoln alive by having him stay in the cold, like, maybe that would be be worth it. <laughs> it's worth discussion. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so a- anything else about that one, or should we go on to the Dunwich Horror? So, Dunwich Horror was one that I could not decide if I really liked uh, or not. Uh, it is certainly very well written. It is, I would say, one of the best works we read. Um, but, ah, uh, there's one just the so much to talk about. Read. Yeah, it was very long. Um, it was a whole 60 pages, which is like one endymion. Anyway, um, <laughs> what I what I like about Yu-Gi-Oh this one... jokes, people. Hey, if you haven't played Yu-Gi-Oh, check it out. Um... What I like about this one is that it talks at length about New England and, um, you know, a significant amount of Lovecraft's works, as far as I'm concerned, you know, the ones that we read did, uh, yeah. take place in the New England area. And um, it, it almost seems as if they do, not because, you know, there's anything particular about, like, the land that it's built on, um, but that in New England there's this uh, unspoken arcane energy and culture uh, that just permeates every facet of, like, quote, civilized society, end quote. Um, the opening portion of, uh, this work, uh, reads like a critique of wealth. Like, it's integrating a racial, uh, like, a racial concept, because it, it talks about how, like, racial purity leads to these disgusting inbred monsters that are subhuman and, um, necessarily predestined to, like, perform witchcraft. Uh, but it also implies that, like, there's an inescapable, decadent destiny for all long-storied families in New England. Um, it describes the length of the branches of a family tree decaying uh, as they become more and more interwoven. Uh, and uh, for this particular scenario, it culminates in this utterly horrific individual, these Wheatleys. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, when eventually the problem is dealt with, uh, it's not destroyed, it's not killed, it's described as being scattered back to the way it was, um, just <laughs> re-permeating throughout New England. So it, it doesn't feel like someone's creating anything or, like, birthing a monster. It feels like they are gathering the, like, unspoken, disgusting uh, decadence that permeates all of New England culture into a single point and then weaponizing it against its populace. And I just thought this was such an interesting uh, avenue um, by which to make a, uh, you know, cyclopean horror. I loved it. I loved it. I must say, you went far more in depth than I ever would have looked into the Dunwich Horror. Uh, my, my analysis, like, I, I you great. wrote down that. I have, like, a sentence. I'm like, it's more fun than scary. Seemed, it, it, it came to me more as, like, just sort of like a scary monster story more than anything. Like I guess there there does it sort is, of have that. It but is there's a scary also this, monster. Story. This this sort of like interdimensional being and the the whippoorwills eating your soul. Which love the whippoorwill that, stuff. That... Um, I love at the very end. It's so ambiguous in terms of the whippoorwills that you can't tell if they are mirroring the speech of the three on the mountain, the monster itself, or the other whippoorwills. It's so cool. Uh, the ambiguity in this story particularly reaches this unreal fever pitch that I, I it just had me on the edge of my seat. I loved the ending. Unfortunately, there was also this middle part. <laughs> I don't know. To, to me, it almost feels like there's a whole bunch of exposition almost at the beginning. Like, yeah, it does get a little artistic with the describing of New England and everything. But a lot of it's just, like, here's Wilbur. Here's what he was like as a kid. Here's what he's like as a teenager. Here's what he's like as a man. Then his dad dies, and all the... Yeah. And then it sort of, like, builds to this climax of the giant monster. I don't know. Go, go ahead, though. Let's, let's, <laughs> your interpretation is far more interesting. No, I... I you're, you're completely correct, you know. Um, I will say the, um... <laughs> uh, when they start calling the, like, rural, uh, non-interbred Wheatleys as of the undecayed branch, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> like, cracking up. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know... <laughs> The ones the that are not disgusting. inbred Wheatleys. <laughs> um, yeah. I do want to talk a little bit about the ambiguity of the ending. Because for me, the the weakest part was the, like, twin reveal at the ending. I was like, what? This makes no sense to me. You're talking about, like, the whole Yogg-Sototh thing? Yeah, well, at the very end, um, 
when he says, oh, it more represented his father. It was his twin, but more represented his father. I felt as if they were just, you know, Lovecraft got to the end of the work and he was like, oh, I need the moments for my friend in the mask to jump out from behind the campfire. Yeah, I need a tag. The, the tagline doesn't have much weight, but it, it makes sense what it was. Yeah. The whole idea that like, oh yeah, this woman interbred with like an intergalactic being and the, the she had two sons and one was already a monster and the other one, well, <laughs> he was, it was really bad. more monster. But, I mean, you already knew that, because we had the whole... I mean, what else could it have been? <laughs> no, uh, I like this one a lot, but uh, there there is a lot of time spent on, like, Wilbur walks between four different universities that I'm just like, yeah. okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> that, that, is, that is another really kind of almost comical thing, is that, like, yeah, part of the, the book concerns the antagonist trying to get a book from the library and being turned <laughs> down. <laughs> I, I do like how... Um, bureaucracies are completely bashed in uh, Colorado space, yeah. but in this one, they are the last preservation of human civilization. Yeah. Literally, <laughs> like, one librarian stood between Wilbur and unleashing the horror of Yog sothoth on the waking world. <laughs> it's like, Wilbur says, I'd hate to allow red tape to come between me and, like, the destiny of humanity, and it's like, wow, <laughs> okay, doesn't get much more literal than that. Thank you, friend. It, it, it's also just weird, too, that, like, as much of a monster as he is, he can't just, like, burst through the wall and take it. Like, he has yeah. to go through the proper channels. He's human enough. As soon as he starts trying to break the rules, a, like, a dog kills him instantly. Yeah, he's killed by a dog. <laughs> or I think uh, it's a couple dogs, because he shoots one yeah, of them. Yeah. I don't know. Dunwich Horror, I have, like, I have them charted out from best to worst. And Dunwich Horror is, like, straight in the middle for me. Where it's, it's like, there's, there's, definitely, there's definitely potential there, it's got some stuff, it's definitely kind of fun, and it kind of, to me, straddles that thing between being, like, a real, like, awesome Lovecraft story, and just being sort of, like, a spooky monster movie. <laughs> yeah. So, the music of Eric Zahn. Yeah, I, I didn't know how to feel about this one. Um, I think I have this at the position you had done with horror, so if you'd like to kick things off. Yeah, it's, well, again, it's, there, there's two different ways you can kind of look at things, look at Lovecraft stories. If we're talking about, like, again, sort of, do they represent anything? Do they have any deeper meaning than music of Eric Zahn? Probably not. Um, if you're looking at as far as, like, is it, an, is it a good horror story? Does it really sort of have this, this feeling of dread, this feeling of the unknown, this fear of the unknown... And I think Music of Eric Zahn is one of his better ones. I actually have this as, like, one of my second favorite. It's just super compelling to me. It has sort of, like, a German expressionist film kind of, like, feel to it. With, like, the giant hill that's, like, impossibly tall that looms over the city. And then, like, the buildings that lean in towards each other so that they almost stop. Like, everything feels kind of twisted. Almost like a nightmare kind of way. And again, it, it's got that, that great, like, indescribable, like, the music that he, that he tries to tries to tell you how the music sounds, and he just can't because it's this impossible, inhuman aurea. I don't, I don't know. That, that's the thing about describing un impossible to describe things. <laughs> how you describe it. No, yeah. Um, spooky, short, showcases the horror of the unknown without resorting to ghosts, demons, witches, or any other kind of known folklore. Which just really hammers home that whole, like, love crafty and feeling to me. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, Music of Eric Zahn, for me, has a couple of really important things. Um, the first is a hatred of Frenchmen, which I think we can all get behind. Um, the <laughs> is, second... Isn't the main character a Frenchman? Oh, there's some discussion of um, the foreign Frenchman. I think he's a Frenchman who hates French composers or something. Oh, okay. Something like which that. Which is understandable. Uh, just, this, is, this is one of his few stories that doesn't take place in... New England, it takes place in France, I believe. Yeah. What I like about this one is that it feels as if uh, it is a discussion of the process of Lovecraft. Um, you know, um, like so many of his other works are like about forbidden knowledge and stuff, uh, so is this one. You know, the pain at which uh, Zahn takes in order to prevent the music he is actively playing from ever being written or described is immaculate. And uh, yeah. you get the feeling that the, like, feverish scribbling that he's doing at the very end is the same type of method by which Lovecraft writes. You know, um, I think this story is meant to give sort of a parallel illusion um, as Lovecraft is this, like, um, 
both uh, combatant to and vessel for a sort of demonic, inhuman knowledge. And the act of writing it down can be profoundly dangerous. Uh, I love that we lose the explanation. That is so, yeah. it's, it's so amazing. It's like he writes for an hour, he sits there and watches him, and then a wind blows in and we lose all the pages. Yeah. Um, we lose a, an unearthly wind. Something else wanted to prevent that knowledge from being spread, perhaps. I love that there is uh, an ambiguity um, as to the point at which uh, Zahn uh, becomes an active combatant against the demonic energy that exists outside his window and a hollow vessel um, that is uh, aiding and abetting it. Um, like a glassy-eyed uh, effigy, it's never, which is fantastic. It's never really quite, like, certain what it is. And again, I think that's, like, Stephen King, which we talked about before before we started this. You're a big fan of Stephen King. Uh, and, I, I uh, have been, yes. I have been, okay. <laughs> I haven't read a bunch of his newer that. stuff, so I, I can't speak to it. His older, yeah, you like his older stuff. He has a lot of uh, themes talking about, like, the fear of the unknown. And a mm -hmm. lot of people kind of give him crap for, like, not explaining things all the way. And, you know, that, that can kind of go either way. There are some horror stories that are really effective because you don't know anything, and some that are really dumb because it just leaves you head-scratching. And I mm -hmm. think Eric Zahn is, like, the, the epitome, the perfect example of not knowing anything, and that's what makes it so scary. Absolutely. This is the one where we get the absolute least explanation. We have a half glimpse of the outside uh, that he is so locked in combat against. We have no understanding of what the music means, and uh, the punishment for even daring to transcribe an explanation is this very, like, Old Testament, biblical style of, like, punishment. It's, it's very, uh, very frightening, yeah. And I think another thing is, um, you were talking about how, like, Zahn sort of transcribes this music and, and sort of like in the same way that Lovecraft transcribes his stories. And I, I've heard it told, I'm not sure how much truth there is in this, but that a lot of his stories were based off of nightmares he had. Apparently he was plagued with nightmares through most of his life. And so it does kind of like, this does have a very nightmarish kind of feel to it. Something that, like, you, you saw in a dream one time. <laughs> and Are you, you telling me? to tell the world about it. Are you telling me this individual who spent his entire career talking about old gods that communicate through nightmares never actually did any creative writing at all? He was just describing <laughs> his own existence. He was just describing his own nightmares. <laughs> which is, again, that, that's kind of why... Um, again, I had talked to you about this earlier. A lot of the mythos... A lot of the Lovecraftian mythos wasn't made by Lovecraft, it was made by writers after him. And he actually mm -hmm. got inserted into his own mythos as sort of like a prophet. A lot of them will say, like, you know, Lovecraft had these visions and he wrote them down thinking they were just nightmares, but they're true. Like, that... Or there's kernels of truth in them, like, Cthulhu is out there. Uh, these, these beings are out there, but they're not quite as he described them. That works entirely perfectly with everything I've read. <laughs> it works. It's just weird to see. That, that'd be something to talk about, especially if we, if we do this again next year. Read some more Lovecraft. Maybe read some of the stuff that came after that. I'll find some of the books that mention him specifically. Because it's really interesting to see an author become part of their own, like, work. It'd be like, you know, if you read a sequel to Lord of the Rings and, like, they were talking about this guy, J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote down the accounts of the First War. <laughs> <laughs> Be like, fuck, what? <laughs> Excuse who, me? This who can forget in uh, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child when they meet J.K. <laughs> Rowling in an alley? <laughs> um, okay. So then, next one, uh, Shadow Over Innsmouth. Kind of, kind of hit or miss. I think we both talked about this. This is one of the ones that's sort of like, just, just in getting this together, we couldn't help but be like, that was a really weird one, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, this one is... Pretty indefensibly racist. Um, you know, um, I, I feel as if Call of Cthulhu is, like, racist in a way that people just aren't anymore. Like, it just throws out terms for, like, uh, Spaniards and uh, Polacks and stuff. The entire nexus of this story is about um, blood quantum and the concept that you have a genetic <laughs> destiny from which you cannot escape. Uh, and, you know, there's a pretty easy parallel there to uh, anything that was happening <laughs> alongside Lovecraft's, yeah. uh, you know, schooling and, and stuff. Well, that's so, well, so what's interesting to me is that, well, I can see, like, that, that clearly is a parallel, this idea of, like, the mixing of the races and stuff like that. 
But again, sort of looking at his history, one thing that always kind of gets brought up, because he has a lot of tales that sort of have this predestiny, and they don't always go with, like, the race mixing. There's a lot of idea of, like, oh, your parents were mad, and so you're going to go mad, too. Um, and the, the thing about him is that, that that's actually true of him. Like, his dad died in an insane asylum, like, when he was, like, two. And then when he was, like, 20, his mother got committed to an insane asylum and also died there. So for him, he did have this sort of fear that, like, what if just I am born and I am destined, like, in ten years, my mind is going to go just like my parents did, and I will die screaming in a straitjacket in some cold sanitarium. And, and that is actually the very end of this story, is uh, uh, my father chose the bullet, you know, what is the avenue yeah. by which I will uh, choose my destiny? Um, that, that is a very exact, like, one-to-one -one ratio. And so it's like, I, I could definitely see the racist stuff there, but to me, I, I, to me, it sort of comes across more like the, more like a generic worry about like, maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe I was born evil, or maybe I was born with some flaw that makes me a monster. Yeah, no. And I think that's a little bit more understood. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that that is certainly a no, just... a more benevolent take than than I am gravitating yeah. towards. Um, I do like uh, the ambiguity of the one part that I thought was interesting um, here was uh, the search effort is firstly one of the only times we really see uh, Lovecraft write an action sequence. Uh, he does it really well. It's I, great. Absolutely, that the action sequence alone, at least to me, sort of raises this above a lot of like the Dunwich horror. Um, I like that it's transcribed in the same variables that the protagonist would be working with. Like, they interrupt, and I'm jumping from rooftop to rooftop to be like, all right, here's the layout of the city. You know, I'm an architect. Uh, I take this road instead of this road because of this. And I was like, you didn't have to write this. You know, I'm not mapping this alongside you. Um, but it's just a, it's just a fantastic narrative tool. You get the idea that he's like this nerd who just <laughs> yeah. to explain this to you in detail. Look here, let me. You can draw a map using this. And then it's not clear as to whether they were trying to locate him in order to kill him, or if they were trying to locate him in order to recruit him. I I, I like to assume that they they were trying to kill him because he didn't have any any hint of like the Innsmouth look at that the point. The Innsmouth look. Read into that as yeah. much as you want, folks. <laughs> It's very fishy. I think it might help that uh, I had played the, the Call of Cthulhu game, the, the good one, from back in, like, the 90s. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who it was by. It it takes place largely in Innsmouth, and it actually recreates that, like, escape from the room scene. Whoa, that's awesome. Where, like, you wake up, you wake up, there's knocking on the door. You have to go and, like, push the bolt open and then bolt unbolt the, like, door next to you, go over, move the furniture in front of the doors before they go... And, like, I died so many times. You have to, like, frantically rush and do all this stuff. It's so, so stress-inducing. And then you jump out onto the roof, and then you, there's this big rooftop chase, and, like, ooh. So that, I, I played that before I ever read it. So maybe that kind of, like, helps build it up. And also it kind of builds up the idea that, like, they're kind of vague with the Innsmouth look. I think they kind of dis well, they do say it's not like any known race that he knows of. It, it describes it, it as something like that the... is not Asiatic or Negroid. Yeah, <laughs> it's none of those things. So he does specifically say, like, this isn't just black people. Yeah. But the, the, the game really kind of goes out of its way to be like, no, these are like, they've got like sort of bulging, fishy looking eyes and like greenish skin. Almost as if they're fish. And, yeah, it's almost like they're fish frog creatures of some kind. This did contain my favorite description of uh, falling asleep, which was a fear preventing you from falling asleep because the room is too dark and it's an unknown location, but a fatigue that prevents you from getting up and turning the light back on. <laughs> I was like, that's just a very human feeling uh, that I'm glad yeah. has persevered long enough. This is spooky and all, but I'm fucking tired. I listened to a drunk guy ramble for like three hours. Exactly. Jesus Christ. <laughs> he really does. Three hours. I don't. I can't decide whether that was a really good move or a really bad move. The, the, just the whole Zadok story in general. Because on the one hand, it, it is kind of just exposition. It's just a guy telling you the story. But sort of presenting it as the ramblings of a mad drunk kind of gives it a little bit more weight. You're not really sure if you can trust it or not. It, it kind of spookier. But then I go back to like, and also you can only understand about half of it. 
What I dislike is that uh, so much of the... I think this one's divided into five. Uh, and then three is almost exclusively um, the Zadok portion. Um, what I dislike is that the first two and then the fourth one are set up to be this like who done it about like the secret of uh, of Insmith, and then like the drunk guy just comes out and tells him for two hours. <laughs> he just explains every single detail of all the mysteries. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, and I've never told people this important piece of information that will connect everything together. It's like, oh, thank you, sir. Very convenient. <laughs> Yeah, it, it maybe would have been more interesting if he had found more clues along the way, sort of, like, hinted to things. Where is Blue's Clues as an old one? Okay, and last one. This took a lot longer than I thought. I yeah. Say. Good luck editing, yeah. idiot. <laughs> it's fine. We just sort of rolled a lot of the discussion. This is different than the normal episodes where it's just the one story just go by, so. Yeah. But yeah, the last one, The White Ship, which is the black sheep of, of the Lovecraft stories. Yeah, this is like um, a retelling of the Odyssey. Is how I felt when I was listening to it. Uh, it, it had a very uh, like a Greek Roman sort of a parable quality to it. I'm reminded of a Pilgrim's Path. If you've ever read, yeah, that yes, story. yes, that yeah. is a that's a perfect. It's very, very much like oh, there is some Zygonos, the land of dreams, the place that everyone wants to go, but no one can step foot on. You try to sail, and you just keep going around the coast. Um, I did like Ooh. that this story definitively proved uh, flat eartherism is correct. <laughs> uh, I, because they <laughs> sailed off the edge of the earth. Hey, you know, I, you can't argue with science. Implying they were on Earth. Clearly they flew to Discworld. This was a Terry Pratchett a crossover oh, decades before his birth <laughs> yeah um i mean it pretty clear critique of ambition you know um uh but instead of being in the vein of like scientific uh knowledge it's in the vein of like more earthly pleasures and i liked the ambiguity that it's very possible that uh, the world of hope or wherever they were ending or attempting to end up was just earth <laughs> he just fell off the edge of the earth into the actual world of hope which is the world we currently live in yeah, because that, that was one of the things, because uh, the, the whole idea, he's on the, the island of fancy. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what he means by fancy, because it's kind of like old-timey speech a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you get, you get this idea, like, I like the idea of, like, he's on the land of fancy, and it's fucking great. There's, like, castles and gold. But then he sees this, this bird that he thinks is from the island of hope. And he's like, it's even better. It's going to be even bigger. And the captain's like, you're already in a great place. Why do you want to go to an even better place? He's like, because it's even better. <laughs> and so he leaves the safety of this place in search of something and just goes off the edge. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I guess it's kind of an ambition. I almost saw it as more of like a cautionary tale of like, enjoy the things you have rather than always searching for more and more. It, it, it seemed more like a condemnation of greed than coming down on, like, don't be ambitious. Right. Uh, and for what it's worth, um, I do think a significant amount of Lovecraft's work is almost a, a, an indictment of curiosity. And, uh, yeah. you know, this is about as curious as one person can get, giving up this eons-long relative safety of just, like, every earthly pleasure uh, just because, like, he saw a bird. <laughs> Crazy dude, not a bird. That's a cool bird, man. Where'd that bird come from? That's no here bird. That must be a there bird. Let's go find where there is at. It's probably better than here. Like nowhere's better than here. You're literally, you're literally in the best. You're in the heaven, essentially. But no, apparently he. I haven't read any of them, but he has another thing of books that's never included in his horror stuff, called the Dream Cycle. Mm -hmm. Sort of like these fantasy adventure stories that take place in this this uh, secondary mythos he made. That's, that's interesting. Sort of based, based off the dream ship sort of stuff. Um, so maybe maybe check out one of those. I don't know, because that as, as sort of uh, basic as, as the metaphor is, I still found the descriptions to be really compelling. Oh, yeah. It has yeah. this almost like fairy tale-esque way of drawing you in. And you could tell, um, I don't remember the name of it, the town of Spires... Um, plagued by demons. Uh, you can tell he's just flexing, like, yeah, you know what I usually do, okay. <laughs> Here's some horror shit, yeah, it's skulls everywhere. Bleached Fuck white man. as the Mad King rules over, alright, yeah, 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 of course. So we'll have to see, also, apparently he has a, uh, a recurring character called Randolph Carter, 
who hunts down Lovecraftian horrors in like three or four different stories. Did we read any that included him? No, we didn't read any. I even the, the I did extra reading because I told you I picked up a whole nother book of his short stories and just read all of them. And uh, there's one that features him in it, although it doesn't it doesn't state him by name. It just calls him Carter, but it's implied that it's Randolph Carter. A young Randolph Carter. Oh, yeah, it says that he's in seven of them. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So I was like, oh, maybe you have to check out some of those, check out some of the Dream Cycle stuff. You guys will have to let us know if there's other... We definitely, if we do this again, definitely got to read Mountains of Madness, because that's probably, like, right next to Color Out of Space is one of his best stories. Oh. And probably Shadow Over Time, because it's just weird. Yeah, I'm looking forward but, to them. Yeah, if there's any other ones... Well, I guess real real quickly, just because uh, I wrote this down, because I read all these other stories, and I wrote, like, one-sentence descriptions. Um, the Temple is a new one I read this year. Probably one of my favorites up there with the, like, music of Eric Zahn just being this really spooky tale. Really underrated. Never heard anyone say it was great, but I fucking loved it. Uh, Mountains of Madness, very good. Uh, Beyond the Wall of Sleep is, like, the white ship mixed with a traditional Lovecraft story. It's got weird fantasy elements. Check that out. Reanimator sucks balls. Despite what the, the movie... Would... I thought, they're like, oh, they made a movie out of this. This is famous. He's got all the green color and shit. The story sucks. Fucking, I was never more disappointed than reading Reanimator. Um, and then The Curious Case of Charles Dexter Ward, which gets brought off occasionally. It's one of his longest ones. It's like a novella. Um, and it was published after he died. They found it amongst his things. And I could see why they didn't publish it, because it also is not all that good. <laughs> Wouldn't recommend it. Um, <laughs> I so see why it wasn't something... published. It sucked. If, well, you know, if you love New England, you might want to check it out, because it's clear that he loves the history of New England. It takes place over, like, 200 years. It, like, jumps back and forth in time. And, like, the second the second chapter is just straight up, like, a guy walking through a New England town and talking about all the history and all the different architecture. You could tell he just loved architecture and he really wanted to talk about colonial times. <laughs> <laughs> but it has nothing to do with anything. It's just like, and here's eight pages of colonial architecture for those of you who are interested. So, yeah, with that, let's get to our actual discussion points, which we've already kind of talked about a little bit. Yeah, this, this, I wanted this to be the first thing we brought up, because it's the first thing that gets brought up almost every time that, uh, that I bring up Lovecraft. There's always some guy who's like, oh, you know, he was really racist, right? Like, yes. Yes, I'm aware of that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's like one of those things you have to deal with. And I, I sort of wanted to bring up, like, does that bother you, reading the, the works of some guy who was just like, profoundly unapologetically racist okay he inherited the cat from his father okay it, it was already named that <laughs> it wasn't going to answer to anything else no uh, <laughs> yes and no i you know we talked a little bit earlier about death of the author and the idea that there exists nothing outside of the text um you know much love to foucault much love to derrida i'm not a i don't prescribe to that or i don't subscribe to that um and I do think... I, I not, I'm not entirely about it, but it's like, for the most part, I feel like you should judge the works on the works. Yeah, there's, I mean, there is a, uh, there is a very easy trap to fall into if you're, like, really into historicism or something, where you just, like, comb the author's tweets uh, to figure out what they innately thought or felt. And the unfortunate yeah. truth is that authors uh, are really good at lying. And... <laughs> You know, I the idea that you, as an individual reading a work in the 21st century, will come away through any amount of research with a perfect understanding of uh, the cultural response to this piece and the cultural factors that made it an inevitability uh, gives a sort of meaning to the text that denies any potential for any author to be subversive. And I think that that's, like, a super dangerous trap to fall into. So I, I yeah. you know, I do agree that, like, you do have to be able to separate the work from the author. But... <laughs> somewhat. But the, the... It is hard not to make allusions to the very popular theories of phrenology that dominated, like, scientific <laughs> discussion groups and how 
frequently they are brought up in literally all of Lovecraft's work. Like, everything we had included a segment where the protagonist diagnoses the uh, blood quantum of one of the characters, or their breeding, or if they were, like, Oriental or Eastern. or And it was, yeah. if nothing else, it was a little bit distracting. Um, yeah, it's, it certainly is in a lot of his stories. Although, like, you know, when, when you're talking about, like, some of his best works, I believe, like, Color Out of Space, Eric Zahn, they don't really, like, go too much into it. It's just sort of like, oh, yeah, these people are out in the country. They're kind of, their breeding's not great. You know how it is, yeah. No, um, and, you know, uh, when the focus of so many of the stories is the fear of this, like, unknown presupposed to evil, you know, it's hard to divorce that from a concept that he believed uh, people presupposed to evil did exist on Earth. Um, yeah. And, uh... Uh, it is it is a little difficult to divorce a weird, consistent worship of, like, higher education and university. Like, oh my god, can you shut up about Harvard? Um, it's hard to divorce <laughs> that from concepts of um, racial segregation uh, that were uh, so yeah. well permeated at those like places. Class structures, too. Like, not even racism, but just looking at sort of, like... You know, oh well, the wealthy elites are the best, and clearly, if you live, if you're an impoverished farmer, you're inherently dumb because of it. See, what I like about specifically the class angle, though, is there are Lovecraftian stories that are subversive with regard to that. Like, I, I do think that Color Out of Space does a good job of elevating. Uh, like folk knowledge as an alternative to scientific inquiry. Uh, I do think Dunwich Horror does a good job of describing how decadence and insular rich communities can very easily, you know, interbreed themselves into disaster. Um, yeah. But, and, yeah, and, by you know, and even, e even with Shadow over Innsmouth, like, as much as he wants to say about how gross and horrific they are and maybe they're murderers, they do also live immortal and worship the true gods. <laughs> Dang. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the I think the um the real the real actually like straight up indefensible racist parts um are the concept that like sub races worship a pantheon of gods that are powerful and like actively malicious. Like, blood sacrifice yeah. tier gods uh, that will bestow you with infinite power. Um if you will just denigrate your racial purity to them. I, I think that's the, 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 the one of the main sticking things for me, is just, like, at least on, a, on an artistic level, like, he may he may have had some racist things, but his, his work as a whole doesn't have, like, racist themes to it. Like, no one's going to read this and become racist, in the same sense of, like, reading, like, I don't know, like, the Turner Diaries or something, is, like, advocating for something. So I'd disagree insofar as... I don't think, I do think it is on some level an advocacy for, like, racial purity, or at the very least, like, eugenics. And, you know, you really only have to go as far as a worship for Harvard and institutions that had eugenic societies, <laughs> like, huge storied groups of individuals who were like, yes, we must breed correctly, um, to recognize yeah. that, like, there is an implicit critique of that. I, I obviously don't think anyone reading this in 2019 is going to become a racist like the the <laughs> yeah. if only because the conceptions of race disparity that are described in Lovecraft's work are so foreign to us by this time like yeah. we're reading stuff about the disgusting Spaniards and we're like who like what yeah sure of that, course that, that, yeah or what was it the the Eskimos at one point but which he uses by some other weird name <laughs> yeah. with like a Q in it and I'm like Eskimos are a different, I guess, kind of. Maybe. But that does lead to a larger conversation of how much media influences culture, its power to do so, uh, and if it's possible for a uh, community and culture that is so detached from the origins of, like, racial bias to enjoy these stories uh, on a merit yeah. that doesn't integrate them. And I think that's probably possible. I, You know, I had fun reading them. I don't want to go out and end the Polish uh, plague on America. <laughs> But, um, you know, uh, I do think that uh, recognizing the uh, yeah. source of a lot of these uh, kind of vague underlying fears of the foreign capital F yeah. are probably critical to understanding the context in which these stories were written. And it, it's, it's one of those things, too, just real quick, I like to bring up. There, there's a lot of, like, sort of Lovecraft apologists, but... It is important to recognize that, like, yeah, he was kind of ra he was racist even for his time. 
There's, uh, I didn't look it up, unfortunately, because I'm not a research guy, but there's famously, he was writing some, Lovecraft used to write to the paper when the papers were, like, the big mass, they were social media. You know, you could get in opinions and you could stuff like that. And there, there's famously, he wrote in an opinion piece talking about, like, condemning all these foreigners and condemning non-whites, and a guy who is famous for being a big racist who was big into eugenics sent a reply that was like, man, you're going too far with this. <laughs> <laughs> like, ra- that, that's the thing, like, racist at the time thought Lovecraft was too racist. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, it's also worth bringing up uh, on a practical level. Like, you know, if you, if you buy R. Kelly's music, you're giving money to a guy who's probably a sexual predator. Allegedly, but probably. Where it's like... Lovecraft stuff is public domain. Yeah, Lovecraft is public domain. He died penniless. He doesn't have an estate that's, like, doing racist things now. <laughs> like, y- you know, reading his stuff doesn't, like, support a bad person in any way. Yeah. If it if it makes you feel any better, he died penniless. So <laughs> maybe being racist was a bad idea. Damn. Cancel culture at it again. Yeah. <laughs> I will say, you know, um, a lot easier to divorce the artist from the art when they are no longer financially profiting off of it. Yeah. When they're not, not only are they not financially profiting off of it, but they're also been dead for like a hundred years. Yeah, you know. And, uh, okay, so then speaking on that, going into, I wanted to talk specifically about, uh, Shadow Over Innsmouth. Specifically in the ending of Shadow Over Innsmouth. There's this element of horror that's often not explored, this idea of like, what if you're just born evil? Which is like, I, I understand, it's, it's kind of a dangerous concept, because if you can believe that you were born inherently evil, if you believe that people something about them can be evil. It kind of opens up the idea that, like, well, maybe we should get rid of the evil people, which is, like, you know... <laughs> then you get to, like, purging people. Right. Like... But again, I, I, I kind of understand Lovecraft's perspective of, like, both his parents died stark raving mad in an asylum, and he had a strong fear that he inherited this untreatable mental illness that would eventually drive him insane. I feel like that's a very real fear that, like, some people have to deal with, and I'm not sure if it's worth exploring if it opens up for this, like, justification of bigotry at the same time. Yeah, like, hard to divorce this from uh, discussions of, like, uh, genetic destiny, um, from discussions of, uh, like, uh, race mixing a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, but uh, I do think that that is a, a very frightening anxiety for a lot of people, you know, um... Not even in terms of, like, racial purity or anything, but just in terms of paternalism. You know, how often does uh, I've turned into my father uh, punctuate, like, a strong psychological yeah. thriller? You know, um, and, you know, it just turns out, in Lovecraft's case, you know, your father might end up being, like, a ancient eldritch god. I don't think of some sort of Lovecraftian comedy thing where it's like, I'm turning into my dad. They're like, we all turn into our parents. Like, it's like, no, no, you don't understand. My dad was a cannibal who ate the hearts I, of his I'm babies. turning into my dad. Literally. He's manifesting in my stomach. <laughs> he's inherited my soul. Of course. I, but I do think that's a, a an interesting, horrific concept um, that kind of puts some external validation, like the fear that you'll become this monstrous deity, um, to uh, what is otherwise a very internal fear, like a fear that you are repeating the mistakes of people who have come before you. Um, and seeing it externalized makes it easier to, you know, fathom and talk about. Um, I guess you could say, in a way, describing this indescribable horror was Lovecraft's greatest work. But you could say it with less of a, an accent. <laughs> yeah, so I guess you, you want to use that to... to um, but yeah, you want to you segue that just into the indescribable horrors? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so, so when talking about indescribable horrors, I think the pair of us have identified that it is much more effective when Lovecraft takes a stab at describing the indescribable than when, you know, you are meant to be scared of a very big monster because he is large and has talons. Yeah. Um, I'd like to kind of field your thoughts on um, which type of description you find more effective and why. Specifically here, I'm thinking about uh, the, I hesitate to say monster, uh, but the monstrous being in Color Out of Space that's in the attic. 
um, and the events oh, that yeah, precipitate yeah. afterwards versus something like a clay figurine that you are told inspires feelings of dread. I don't know. Like I said, it's, it's, it's hard to sort of debate because we both agree that like sort of being vague and if you can do it correctly is much more effective than like telling you exactly how the things work. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of an example where telling you exactly how the things work like was effective, but I can't really I can't really think of an example of that. Well, the one I found effective was in the Dunwich Horror. Um, the creature is very literally invisible for the entirety of the yeah. piece, and everyone's just like, "Oh, you know, it's invisible." And then one of the it's characters, it's invisible, but it it leaves footprints the size of a house. One of the characters invents a garden sprayer, like claims credit for invention of the garden sprayer, <laughs> and throws a cloud of dust on it, and it is described in pieces by a man who is immediately driven mad, of course. Um, yeah. But the description is horrifying, and uh, it's described as like a writhing mass of ropes and faces and mouths, and what I think is very exciting from my perspective when uh, these horrors are described, is when they're described in bits and pieces. You get a sense of the feet. You get a sense of the uh, body. You get a sense that uh, their facial geometry is not the same as our facial geometry. It's kind of how in Call of Cthulhu you are told there is a building, but you are also told there is a portion of the building you cannot fathom. <laughs> and it has really real impacts uh, for the individuals who accidentally step on the stairs and are whisked into nothingness. <laughs> and whisk, he fell into a core. He just disappeared into the geometry somehow. So it goes. Damn non-Euclidean space. Yeah, I guess I, I'm reminded of, uh, are you familiar? There's a channel on YouTube called Overly Sarcastic Productions. I'm unfamiliar. They, they do a combination. They, the, they talk about like tropes and stuff, and they also do history stuff. And one year for Halloween, they did a thing where they looked at, like, some Lovecraft stories. And the girl there kind of made fun of the fact, like, that, like, you know, color out of space. You're like, oh, it's a mysterious color that no one understands. And then they get to Call of Cthulhu, and it's like, it's a mysterious building that no one understands. Like, when it comes down to it, you're just like, you're not really explaining a thing. You're just telling us that it's mysterious. And I can get how that can be kind of, like, underwhelming. It can be frustrating. But I don't know, I feel like he does it so well that, you like, if you have an imagination... I'm not sure if I want to accuse them of not having <laughs> an imagination, but I feel like he, he invokes such imagery that it's it's more than just saying, like, and no one knows what it looks like. Ooh. The way I've been explaining it to my friends um, is Lovecraft is really good at writing other people trying to describe things that are indescribable. Uh, if it's, I'm going to mess this name up yeah, again, but I think that's uh, a if really Nahum, good... uh, when he is trying to describe the way the color works in relation to his wife that has become this, like, misshapen um, horror, uh, and talks in, like, these, like, fragmented sentences about qualities of the thing, not about a visual description of it. Um, when it's uh, the undecayed Wheatley <laughs> talking about... Um, uh, the ropes and the mouths just being wrong and feeling incorrect and being incomprehensible. Um, not necessarily, you know, their position or how many of them there were. Um, those are the type of things that frighten just me. Just that they're wrong. Yeah, I think that I think that's a good point. Is like it has to do with like if you were the author trying to describe it outright, it's like it almost feels like you kind of failed if you can't describe something. But if you have someone else doing it, like. Well, yeah, that character doesn't comprehend this. It's they people who should be it. able to, and they're yeah. just functionally unable. I mean, Nahum lived with this thing for, like, what, like a decade? And yeah. for some reason, uh, he is uh, just rendered completely nonsensical. Uh, the color and the well and the light. And it's, it, there's a sucking about the thing. Yeah. It just sucks. What can I say? <laughs> I'm reminded of... It's this movie, and it's a god-awful movie, but it does one thing really, really well. Have you ever heard of uh, The Fourth Kind? Oh, yes. Yes, the the, the alien movie that's actually on, on a subsequent viewing, like, it's actually kind of trying to be a Lovecraftian movie that's disguising itself as aliens. It's actually quite, kind of clever in that regard. It's like all these people studying the, this footage, people who assume it's aliens, and then at the end it's like this gibbering ancient Babylonian deity that just wants to bring suffering. 
They're like, well, you don't sound like an alien at all. I was like, well, it's not really. It's a Lovecraftian <laughs> monster. But I, I digress. The, the thing about it that, that really works, the only thing about it that works really, is they have these point where they're interviewing people who were supposedly abducted out of their beds at night. And they're talking about like, okay, what did you do? And they're like, I looked out the window and there was an owl out my window. They're like, an owl? They're like, yeah, but it was, its head was big and its eyes were bigger and it was, and they just start like frowning and shaking their head and they're like, was it really an owl? And they're like, it has to be an owl. Like, just this, like, fear of, like, unable to recognize or describe what it actually is, but only be able to see, like, it's owl-like. <laughs> like, I feel like that really works, and that's the sort of Lovecraftian description. Sorry, I went on a huge rant there. You still there? No, it was good. I appreciated okay. it. So, aliens, uh, aliens aside, <laughs> we go to our next point. There's no real good transition to that. We're just going to a next talk talking point. I'm being real with you today, audience. Hello. How are you, by the way? Comment in the comments. How are you doing? You having a good time? But, yeah, there's, there's a quote from Call of Cthulhu that both sort of encapsulates everything that people kind of love about Lovecraft, and is also, like... I'm not sure if I'd call it problematic, but it's got some implications that we've been sort of talking about back and forth. But I want to read this quote off in its entirety, and it is, The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of a black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little, but some day the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into a peace and safety of a new dark age. Kind of anti-science. <laughs> this quote's awesome. I, I really absolutely love this quote. You know, there's not a ton to uh, talk about in terms of the Call of Cthulhu uh, because it is... Uh, so relentlessly descriptive but that particular quote is such a fantastic opening not only to call of cthulhu but to the entirety of lovecraft's work um and it's just, uh, just this idea that like learning could be bad for you kind of goes counterintuitive to like everything i've ever learned for lack of a better word it is almost psychotic how Lovecraft is simultaneously uh, just lauds the capacity of these like New England schools like Harvard um, and simultaneously is like, but you know, you can't let them get too far. Uh <laughs> yeah, I think that's kind of the weird duality of it is that like a lot of his stories have this theme of science driving you mad because that's what he's afraid of. He's afraid of that the, the think... The thing that he loves the most, this idea of learning, this idea of being exploring, the, all these good ideals are actually bad for you. Like, that's a terrifying thought. I agree. I do think that a significant amount of um, Lovecraft's work represents uh, a general failing of uh, modern methods of science, scientific analysis, and like the scientific method uh, to cope with things that have outlived them by eons. You know, a significant amount of um, the spells in the Necronomicon designed to cage like the Deep Ones or uh, to entrap Cthulhu rely on this sort of arcane, I mean, I don't want to get all tropey, but like noble savagey type of understanding. Um, yeah. A, a rural knowledge that supersedes science. Like, science uh, inevitably seeks to explore, but so much of this work is about how exploration uh, can go so wrong so quickly. So wrong, um, so very quickly. I think even in, in Cool Air, they actually talk about it a lot, where he's like, oh yeah, there's these alchemical incantations, and science thinks that they're just dumb, you're just saying stuff, but I think there's, like, a psychological thing there where, like, saying certain words and phrases, like, actually increases the vitality of your, your uh, separate pieces. And it's hard to determine exactly what he's advocating for. Uh, yeah. But a lot of it seems to be a taking seriously of, um, like, the ritual of, uh, unscientific life so to say or a recognition that science represents a an extremely dangerous ritual of its own you want to be skeptical of science but you also don't want to be like 
the guy out chanting in the woods all day. <laughs> yeah, and just like how um, the Wheatleys spent so much time gathering sort of the dark energy of New England into this singular uh, body, uh, so did, you know, the scientists that encountered the meteorite um, accidentally spread its uh its malign influence to these disparate parts of the world that otherwise wouldn't have been affected and um i i do think it is a an attempt at connecting the ambition of science the ambition of knowledge for knowledge's sake with the ambition of people seeking to end the world you know i don't think you are meant to think that the mad arab or um wheatley's father or uh, the old what's the guy's name in shadow over insmith um old baligula uh... <laughs> i don't think you're meant to think that these characters are any different than the characters pursuing knowledge for knowledge's sake um both of them are trying through different means uh, to amass uh, too much understanding in the same being and both of them are punished uh, equally badly yeah i, I it kind of almost goes back to the white ship this idea of like enjoy what you have don't don't go off exploring in either direction. If you go too much science, bad stuff will happen. If you go too much mystical, bad stuff will happen. Just sort of enjoy the earthly pleasures, I guess. It is very explicit in White Ship, yes. It, it's almost hopeless in a way where it's sort of like, no matter what you do, you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're doomed either way. Either you're going to be ignorant and something you don't expect is going to kill you, or you're going to go looking for something, and then something you don't expect is still going to kill you, except you will have deserved it because you went looking for it. That is a beautiful segue into our fifth discussion point, if you're prepared to yeah. end up there. we It's funny, I wrote down a lot of notes, and then we ended up talking about most of them when we talked about the, the individual stories. I mean, it's hard to divorce them from um, from the meat it, it probably flows better that way. Maybe this is... I'm making the podcast better. Thank you, MBT. <laughs> it, was, it was all part of the plan. It was all part of the plan. But yes, the, the sort of inevitability of, of Lovecraft is what you wanted to talk about. Almost like right. the hopelessness of it, but it also kind of gives a little hope. So a lot of uh, the work that we read, um, I'm thinking specifically here of Shadow Over Innsmouth. Um, I'm thinking specifically of Color Out of Space, uh, of... Call of Cthulhu. Yeah, and all the stories that aren't just, like, personal stories. That aren't campfire sagas. Um, they end on a note of, at some point in the very near future, there will be a cataclysmic test of humanity. Uh, and locating and assembling the building blocks necessary to stave it off is, you know, depending on the story, either, like, the utmost imperative or extremely dangerous. And I do like that protagonists like Wax and Wayne, on which of these they support, you know, um, for example, in Call of Cthulhu, uh, the individual goes a little bit mad and uh, is to some degree a denizen <laughs> of the Cthulhu cult. Well, he's in... at least, the, the whole point of the story is that he's writing that tale out so someone can know the truth. Yeah, exactly. Um, in uh, Color Out of Space, uh, there is a fearful understanding uh, that at some point the protagonist will again uh, have to venture out to the blasted heath. Someone will have to figure out what's going on. Uh, there will be a cataclysmic event uh, of human proportions, and he is already writing down individuals who may be affected or may be responsible. And in um, Shadow Over Innsmouth, the individual just completely uh, releases his shackles on humanity and is like, yeah, it's inevitable. I will live down there until it happens. It's inevitable, but I'm one of the monsters, so this okay with me. Really lucked into that one. Um, yeah. So I think there's there's an implicit discussion that isn't had in these about the value of preserving a civilization that is ultimately doomed. There's a lot of time spent in the story proper trying to stave off an end that everyone at the end recognizes is coming. And that, that is really interesting because I've never heard... Of all the words I would use to describe Lovecraft, hopeful is not one of them. But I think that's what sort of differentiates him from a lot of these horror authors. I'm trying to, I'm thinking of like the guy who wrote I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. Harlan Ellison. Yeah. All of his work just has this like nihilistic, like nothing matters, everything is death, everything is horrible, everyone is shit. 
It has, like, these Lovecraftian themes, but it doesn't work for me. And I think that's partially because no one in his stories tries to preserve the, the, their humanity. Mm -hmm. I think Lovecraft, like, has this really great dichotomy of knowing that everything is doomed, of knowing that if he drifts too far, that he'll go mad, and wanting to go there anyway. And yeah. I think that's kind of what makes him, like, a, a little, a level above some of the, these other horror authors. And it is portrayed as a giant win for humanity, even if we can, like, artificially extend the length in which we are allowed to roam the Earth by a matter of decades. It's this huge, uh, unsubstantial win uh, against the inevitability of time. And shockingly, of all the stories, I think this is one in which cool air matters. Um, <laughs> because just like, you know, this individual is completely, completely understands that he will uh, eventually succumb to death. Uh, so do all the protagonists in the Cyclopean stories understand that at some point the great Cthulhu will rise again and humanity will be scoured from the face of the earth. But yeah. until that happens, every singular moment driven by sheer willpower and ambition is a monumental win for humanity. And even though some of the resolutions uh, are as weak as, I guess Cthulhu accidentally fell back into his prison, um, <laughs> Oops. You, you have to claim uh, these victories over powerful gods uh, for humanity. Um, yeah. And, and like you said, it ends up being, even in the face of certain inevitable doom, strangely hopeful. I have on my shelf the Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game, the book, and... One of the things it says at the beginning is, you do not defeat the monsters in, in the Lovecraft mythos. You survive them. And I always thought of that as, like, really depressing. But yeah, the fact that you... There is a still winning game state. That is at least something. And kind of like with his other stuff, you know, trying to kill them, trying to overcome everything, that's that's the, the bird of hope, you know. Sometimes you just got to enjoy what you can, the victories you can get while you can get them. And that's an easy translation into actual modern life. You know, the evils of the world are never going to abate. They are never going to cease. They will always exist, stoked by uh, fires of uh, greed and ambition worldwide. Um, and while that will never end, the endless struggle against them is an intensely noble pursuit. And I, I think that is the core of the Lovecraftian ideology. And uh, it, it is a message of hope. And I'm, I'm glad we read it. Good, yeah, good, good sum up. I'm not sure if I have any other ending thoughts to do, yeah. I hope you all enjoyed listening to this. Again, let us know what you thought down in the comments. Thank, thank you again, MBT, for joining me. Thank you for having me. I had a great time, and um, I hope that we were sufficiently spooky. Yeah. <laughs> spooky subtext. Ooh. <laughs> Talking about the ramifications and metaphors and hopefulness. That's not and really the funny. author was dead! Oh, he's dead the whole time. <laughs> Who would have thunk? Um, and let's see, real real quick, next next month, and this was already decided before you came on, um, <laughs> me and the other the other co-hosts are going to do this. Hopefully my basement will be fine by then. If you want to join us, you're, you're certainly free to, and if, if you do stick around, we can, uh, we can have you pick like a story next time. But Ooh. we are going to do uh, American Gods by Neil Gaiman. Are you oh, familiar I've with that story at all? It. I've always wanted to read it. Uh, oh, I have okay. read shockingly little Gaiman. Yeah, this was my first time reading him. I'm not sure if I'd call him, like, one of my favorite authors or anything, but, uh, you know, he, he has so I can see why people like him so much, and I'll be interested to talk about it. So, if yeah, you, you know, if you guys want to join us in on the club, make sure you pick up a copy of American Gods by Neil Gaiman. Check that out. And uh, until next time, we still don't have an outro. Yeah, you have an outro you want to try? Uh, yeah, give me a sec. Nope. <laughs> I've got nothing. <laughs> <laughs>